In 1828, Carl Friedrich Gauss put forward his Theorema Egregium, his remarkable theorem. A parametrized surface, X, parametrized by U and V, is differentiable if we can choose a unit normal vector at each point on a surface given by the normal mapping, which is the cross product of the tangent vectors given by x of u and x b. The tangent vectors live on the tangent plane. Now this normal mapping is a differentiable map. And what Gauss realized was that this constitutes a differentiable field of normal vectors. That is, a surface at every point can have a normal vector defined on it, which helps us orient the surface. In fact, when a surface is orientable, it means it has a field that is differentiable of normal vectors on the surface. Now the Gauss map is a specific normal mapping. And so since at every point on a surface, a normal vector can be defined, that is on an orientable surface, Gauss map takes that normal vector and maps it to the center of the unit sphere, like a radius vector. And as that normal vector will change over the surface of it, S, that will also change on the unit sphere. Now what Gauss realized is as this is doing this, the differential of the Gauss map, a mapping between the two tangent planes, tangent plane of the surface to the tangent plane of the unit sphere, those two tangent planes are parallel to each other. Now to give you a sense of orientation, consider the cylinder here given by x squared plus y squared equals one. And so if we choose a unit normal vector or just a normal vector pointing inward given by negative x, negative y, zero, and we can define a parametrized curve on the surface, then the gradient of that surface given in implicit form can define a normal vector on the surface. And then that we know be since that the normal vector with a dot product and its tangent vector will always equal zero, we can show that here, the dot product of two perpendicular vectors being zero will give us an equation that shows that either n being x, y, zero, or n being negative x, negative y, zero, both constitute normal vectors to the surface, two different orientations. So given our orientation, the differential of the Gauss map is negative x prime, negative y prime, zero. Okay, so a little linear algebra. A linear map A, as in a matrix, from a vector space onto itself is called self-adjoined if it has the following inner product or dot product property. And there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence between self-adjoined linear maps and quadratic forms that live in this vector space. And this is important for us to define an orthonormal basis for a vector space. So given a self-adjoined linear map, there exists an orthonormal basis for that vector space, such that the matrix A is diagonal, and its eigenvalues on this diagonal matrix precisely correspond to the maximum and minimum values of the quadratic form defined by the inner product in this vector space. Now Gauss observed that because the tangent spaces of the surface, as well as the one on the unit sphere are parallel to each other, the differential of the Gauss map can be equivalently written as a map of the tangent plane of the surface to itself. That is that there's a natural mapping in this differential map of the Gauss map, where we can rewrite it as a map of the tangent plane to itself. Thus, we can define this as a self-adjoined linear map. Which this just translates to the idea that we can make all of our calculations for the map 
done on the tangent plane surface of the surface we started in. In other words, it can be measured by locals. Now, since the differential of the Gauss map is a self-adjoined linear map, the associated quadratic form given by the inner product is what is known as the second fundamental form. So Gauss realized that there is a very strong importance of using the normal vector to define curves and surfaces in two and three dimensions. Now recall that this normal vector helped us to find the curvature of a curve, how much a curve bends away from a straight line. And if we find the curvature in two principal directions by taking two normal sections of the surface that are perpendicular slices, we can then define something called the Gaussian curvature or the surface curvature by taking the product of those two principal curvatures. And that was something that can be intrinsically defined by locals and something that helps us define or classify the type of surface we have. And here we note that the Gaussian curvature is the determinant of the differential of the Gauss map where the mean curvature is half the negative trace of the differential Gauss map, the matrix associated with that self-adjoined linear map. And this self-adjoined linear map helps us to find different types of surfaces. Positive Gaussian curvature gives us an elliptical surface where hyperbolic surfaces are for negative Gaussian curvature. And zero Gaussian curvature can either be parabolic or planar, but in any case, Someone living on the surface, a local, could determine this Gaussian curvature and thus determine what kind of surface they were actually living on, despite how that surface might be embedded in the ambient space. So just how do locals measure in intrinsic ways? Well, they need to use their tangent vectors. The first fundamental form, or the metric form, uses these tangent vectors, these partial derivatives, x1 and x2, as the basis for the tangent space, and that helps us define the differential of the Gauss map. Any parametrized curve gamma given on a surface x would have to find its velocity vector or derivative by using the chain rule, and the chain rule here in vector notation is given in the following way. And if we just renotationize things here, that's even a word, we can rewrite this as u prime x1 plus v prime x2. The velocity vector is simply a linear combination of our tangent vectors x1 and x2 in our tangent space, giving us the idea that these things can be measured in the tangent space. So now if we wanna find the length of a curve, as locals would do, we would need to find this integral, the arc length integral. And this is now given via the dot product, which emphasizes the product, the dot product of the basis vectors really completely determines the arc length. So the x1 times x1 and x1 times x2, we'll just do a little slight notation change and call these dot products by the following g notations. And this is called the coefficients of the first fundamental or metric form. And together they can form a matrix, which later can be interpreted as something you might be familiar with called the metric tensor. The metric tensor is a collection of these dot products of the tangent vectors in different combinations. And so taking the square root of that quadratic form that will happen in that dot product is the way that we can calculate the arc length using the first fundamental form coefficients g11, g12, and g22. Okay, so now that was kind of your first taste into what a tensor looks like. Now later, you might ask, how would I go about measuring an angle as a local? And this is going to be via the dot product formula for two vectors. And this gives us a way of calculating the angle through a cosine formula you see here, which can be redefined using the dot or inner product of the two vectors. 
So you see that the inner product of the vectors, and especially the dot product of the basis vectors, really forms a sound foundation for this intrinsic quality. So replacing our just random vectors with our tangent vectors here, we can redefine the angle measured intrinsically using the coefficients of the first fundamental form, g12, g11, and g22. So angles again here on the surface can be measured intrinsically. Okay, so that's how we measure angles. We can measure distance and we can measure angles. Now recall that a unit normal vector is the cross product of two tangent vectors divided by its length. And the normal vector on a surface may not correspond to the same direction as the unit normal vector, depending on the orientation chosen. So using the cross product squared formula, we can see that the cross product length is equivalent to the square root of the determinant of the metric matrix or the metric tensor. And so we can correlate, there's some sort of extra property to the normal vector, that cross product that sticks out of the tangent plane that shows us that normal vectors really tell us something about the extrinsic property of a surface, not so much the intrinsic property. Now, the magnitude of the cross product of those tangent vectors leads us to an idea of how to use that square root of the determinant of the metric to find the surface area, defining surface integrals that you might be familiar with from vector calculus. Theorema egregium. A surface can be entirely determined intrinsically by measuring distances, angles, and their rates of change on the surface, made by locals. Gaussian curvature can be measured intrinsically using the first fundamental form, and the second fundamental form can be extracted as well. And two surfaces are considered locally isometric when they have the same Gaussian curvature. Surface curvature is independent of the way a surface sits in the ambient space. So Gauss really was, he found this remarkable that locals on a surface can say so much about the three dimensional aspect of this surface without actually having to leave the surface. And that was done by just living, experiencing the things that we can measure on their tangent planes and using that information to tell us everything we need to know about the surface. And investigating this further led him to some deeper results. One that's known as the Gauss-Binet theorem. The Gauss-Binet theorem tells us how the Gaussian curvature is related to angle changes. So we start with a spherical triangle that is sometimes known as a geodesic triangle on a sphere. The angle measures inside the triangle will actually be greater than what we would find on a triangle made on a flat plane. In other words, a Euclidean triangle. We learned in high school that the three angles inside of a triangle on a plane always add up to 180 degrees or pi radians. So there is an excess of angles that you'll measure on a spherical triangle. And so measuring the difference between the angles measured on a spherical triangle and that of a flat triangle is called the angle excess. And it is found by doing the integrating a surface integral of the Gaussian curvature over this triangle. And this is known as the Gauss-Binet theorem. And it can tell us about what kind of angle differences there are and related to the Gaussian curvature. So angle excess in the surface triangle is directly related to the Gaussian curvature, therefore showing that it is an intrinsic quality. Angles can be measured intrinsically, Gaussian curvature can be measured intrinsically. And this later led Gauss to his divergence theorem, something that is what quite celebrated in Calc 3 and it relates the volume integral to the surface integral, which also led Gauss to some pretty interesting results in the theory of electromagnetism. And Gauss even has a law named after him in the theories of electromagnetism. But really what Gauss's formula shows us is 
just why you can't make a flat map of the world. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you liked this video. Please hit that like, subscribe, and notification bell for more videos. And stay tuned for the next one. Thanks for watching.